And I wanted to talk this morning about wonderful privilege, which is prayer, water walking power, and a willing Savior who's portrayed here. But if you would join me first in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, your word is so beautiful. And every word in it is designed to lead us in one direction to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a beautiful thing that is. Such love we can't even comprehend. And yet it's that love that brought our Savior to this world. But Father, we need to understand that your love does not save us. As we talked about in Sunday school, it's the blood of Christ, that sacrifice that does. And I thank you for that. And I thank you, Lord, for those who have come this morning. And I pray that everyone here has already come to Jesus for salvation. And I pray that if there's one here this morning who's not made that commitment or is not sure of their salvation, that this would be the day that the Holy Spirit convicts them. So, Father, again, as always, I ask that the Holy Spirit would work in every heart and have his way in every life here today. Because everything we say and do and think, we want to be for your honor and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Yeah, we read, when you start reading this particular section there in Mark 6, beginning in verse 45, two words really jump out at me. He says, straightway he constrain the disciples to get into the ship. Two words there tell us something important. The word straightway and constrained. You see, these words tell us there's an urgency in what Jesus wants to do. You know, we have an urgency in our life too. The urgency is to get the gospel message out there before it's eternally too late. But Jesus felt an urgency. You know, that's an amazing thought, isn't it? Jesus has an urgency? Yes, he did. Have you ever thought about in that little three and a half year window there that Jesus walked this earth preaching the gospel, how much he needed to do and the time constraints. There's urgency. But this is a little different. Why did he feel that urgency? Mark doesn't give us the reason, but if you're not lazy and you read the Bible, you'll find out the reason. All you have to do is go to John chapter six, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. There's the urgency. Jesus knew these people wanted to. There was going to be an attempt to force him to be king. Of course, they couldn't do it. You need to understand, absolutely, I don't care what kind of army, I don't know how many there are, they couldn't force Jesus to be king right then. But he does not want to have... You know, this confusion going on. And he can't be forced to do what he's not going to do. So this, there's clearly two reasons that we see why the urgency is here to leave that area. First, as I said, the people desired to make Jesus king, but not king of kings. They simply wanted him to be the physical ruler of the land. They saw Jesus as a, the preferred ruler rather than Rome and Caesar or the Herods. They hated those people. And because of the number of people who are always following Jesus, there was always that multitude, they were, I think in their mind, we can build a great army and destroy our enemies. You remember at this time when Israel's looking for a Messiah, the majority of Israel was looking for a soldier, a general, and not the spiritual leader that's coming. They're not looking for God. They're looking for freedom from oppression. And so their desire was not so much for Jesus, but the desire to get the ones they hated out of their lives, and they thought Jesus could be that answer. They didn't see Jesus as the Messiah, just a potential ruler who could push Rome away. <clears throat> and secondly, though, there were a small number of people who saw Jesus as the Messiah. And they wanted to make him king. They wanted him to be king of kings. They wanted him to be king Messiah. But as Jesus says repeatedly in the scriptures, my time has not yet come. So the urgency is to remove his disciples and himself from this situation. Because all things, then as well as now, happen according to God's time and his purpose, and it's perfect. Even the timing of events is perfect. 
So today, when somebody tells you so-and-so is the Antichrist, just smile and go on. It's not true. Or the Lord's coming back on Thursday. He may come back for us, but you don't know that. The time is in God's time. It's perfect. <clears throat> just like when Jesus came and would be born in that little stable in Bethlehem. God's time. And Jesus has an appointment yet to go. What's the appointment? Calvary. He will be heading to Jerusalem and nothing is going to interfere with that week, with that walk up that hill and those nails in his hands. Nothing is going to keep from that. And nothing is going to keep him in that tomb. So that's why there's an urgency for the call for his disciples to get in that boat and leave the area. Then we read, and when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. That, to me, that is so powerful when you think about it. Jesus is going to pray. How many times did Jesus go out in private to pray? How many times were we told? I imagine this was a daily thing. We're not told that, but I imagine it was. He would go out alone because there's something special in spending time alone with God. You know, Jesus has been, the Son has been with the Father for all eternity. And there's that time that He needed, just like we do, alone. You know, many people today are uncomfortable praying in public, and I understand that. Some people don't like to talk to them. If it's more than two people, it's a crowd, and they're, they don't like to do that. They're just uncomfortable. So what they don't understand is that when you do pray in public, you don't have to pour out all your dirty laundry. You don't have to talk about all the things that are wrong in your life. You wait to get to your prayer closet, and then when you're one-on-one -on -one with the Lord, then you can open up. When you're in your prayer closet, you can talk with the Lord. And don't hold anything back. There's no one else around to make you feel guilty or uncomfortable. It's just you and the Lord. If you do feel guilty, you need to confess. If you're uncomfortable, there's something you're holding back. So talk with the Lord. But there's still those moments. We still have a tendency, even when we're in our little prayer closet, that one-on-one -on -one time, that we attempt to cover up our sins and we attempt to hide from God. Even when we're one-on-one, -on -one, why are we like that? Why are we trying to hide or hold something back from the Lord? Why can't we just be open and honest with Him? He already knows everything about us. He knows the sin you committed. He knows the things you thought. Why are you trying to hide it from Him? Yeah. So when you pray, don't keep things from God. Try to imagine standing over and listening to Jesus pray. Wow, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Nothing is held out between those two. But to, if you keep things from Him, from the Lord, it's just going to make you feel worse. You're going to be miserable. You're going to feel guilty about the things in your life. That's why you really need to confess them. You know, the longer you go without confessing those sins, the easier it gets. And the more sins you hold in, and the farther you find yourself separated from God. And the harder it's going to be to pray because you're going to start holding more and more in. We need to tell Him. It's, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But John goes on to say this. This is something important for us to remember when we're praying. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. So when you're in your prayer closet, when you're talking to the Lord one-on-one -on -one and you do not confess those sins, you're actually saying to Him, I haven't sinned. Somebody's lying, and it's not the Lord. You say, well, how can that be a lie? It's a sin of omission. You know you're guilty, but you're not confessing it. Be honest with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to feel a great deal better when you do. I promise you that. You will feel better. Because He's going to forgive you. Your sins are forgiven and remembered no more. And I know there are times when your prayer life, if your prayer life's like mine, and I'm sure it is. There are times when you feel closer to the Lord than others. When your heart is completely open and you're talking with Him and you're, you actually feel Him talking back to you and the, the relationship is so close. And other times, it's not that way. But the fault is not the Lord's. It's ours. 
Many times we pray with our hearts and our minds not completely focused on God. And there are other times when we allow those wicked thoughts of the world to enter in and steals our peaceful and private time with Him. It's easy to do. And I know you can be sitting in the best sermon somebody's ever preached and your mind still will wander. It's just like your prayer life. The devil's always trying to get you to, to take your focus off of the Lord. But when you're in your, your praying and you start thinking about the things of the world, that means your focus is on the world and not on the Lord. That should never be with a Christian. But the world has such a pull. The world is a magnet and it just draws you to it. You have to fight. But see, you don't have to fight alone. You have the Holy Spirit within you. Follow Him. When your life is too worldly, your prayer life is going to be the same way. You're going to have to push the world away. We say, well, that's easier said than done. It is, isn't it? There's so many things out there that want to pull you over. And then there are those times when we pray with routine. I mean that we pray the same prayer so much, it's memorized. How is it we can memorize the same old prayer that we pray over and over again, but we can't memorize a memory verse? Repetitive. We just repeat the same thing over and over. And then when you finish praying, you say, I don't feel any different. Because it wasn't a heart prayer. It's like going to one of the denominations that has a prayer book and everybody stands up and they read that prayer like a hymn and they sit back and you haven't prayed. You read. We need to get away from the routine. And then there's the times that we go to the Lord and we make demands. Well, rather than ask Him, we just demand. Lord, give me this, give me that. Like I've said, like my brother said, he had four kids. Buy me, bring me, give me, take me. And that's the way we approach the Lord. Give me this, buy me that, lead me. You know, and we're not to do that. When we're having our private time to pray, we need to leave the things of the world out there. And we request things from God. And we enter into our prayer closet with thanksgiving. You know, the born-again believer has a great privilege of going boldly before the throne of grace. The unbeliever cannot do that. They can't go there. Because you pray through the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Son to the Father. Without the Holy Spirit, that entranceway is not open. You have to be saved. And we have that opportunity. You know, over in Psalm 104, it tells us, enter to His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. How often do we go and begin our prayer thanking the Lord? How often do we tell the Lord we love Him? We need to talk to the Lord with an open heart. Hold nothing back from Him. Tell Him you love Him and thank Him for the provisions that He has given you. And there are many. You're not going to be able to name them all. You won't even remember them all. It's kind of like your sins. There are some sins we commit, we'll never remember them. But you still confess what you can. Tell Him about those sins and weaknesses. And ask for strength to overcome them. Tell Him your needs and the desires of your heart. He wants to hear. And do not be afraid to ask again and again and again until you get the clear answer. Some, I heard someone say, well, don't ask Him more than once. I'm going to ask until I get the answer. You know, sometimes, He always answers. Sometimes you just don't hear to ask the needs and pray for others. And when you pray for others, ask for a heart for the lost that you put a burden on your heart. If you don't have a heart for the lost, you're not going to support missions. You're not going to pray for other souls. You're not going to get excited when you hear somebody be saved. And pray for a heart for your brothers and sisters in Christ and a heart to serve. Wow. Wow. You know what you just did? You're praying to be a servant for the Lord. And that goes against the world today. The world doesn't want to be servants. The world wants to be up here and everybody serve them. We have to be like Paul and the other apostles. We want to be a doulos, a bond servant of the Lord. And most importantly, when you pray, talk with the Lord and not to the Lord. 
Remember, it's a conversation. You're talking with the Lord. You need to wait on His reply and then be willing to follow what He says. You know, when you sit down and talk to someone, if we're in here and are having a fellowship meal, we talk with each other, not to each other. See, right now I'm talking to you. I'm not asking you to return anything. But when I'm talking to the Lord, I want a conversation. And there's the difference. So many times we just go to the Lord and we just talk to Him. Lord, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do for me. And, it, and that's what we do. And by the way, you don't have to wait till bedtime to pray. You don't have to pray, wait the first thing in the morning. You don't have to wait till mealtime. Pray without ceasing. There are going to be times during the day that the Lord puts something on your heart. The Holy Spirit puts something on your heart. Pray. It doesn't have to be a 20 minute prayer. Somebody sends you a prayer request. Brother so-and-so is sick. Just say, Lord, please be with brother so-and-so. Help healing. In Jesus' name. That's all. Pray all the time for everything. When you go out somewhere and you're thinking about that purchase and you look at it and you want it. And I want it. How many times do you ask the Lord, is this what I need to do? Is this what you want for me, Lord? For me just to, to jump into this? How many people say, I want a new car. They go, go out and buy a new car. And then, wow, I can't afford it. Or I can't. Ask the Lord. There's nothing too big, nothing too small. Pray when you need to. When the Holy Spirit puts it upon your heart. You know, it's time for each and every member of the church, each and every one of us, to become prayer warriors. If there's a, something, there's two things that are really neglected by Christians. Reading the Bible and praying. The two most wonderful things of the Christian life and we ignore them. One leads to the other, by the way. You don't read the Word, you begin to move away from the Lord. And you move away from the Lord, you don't really want to talk to Him. The more you sin, the less you want to talk to Him. Get into the Word and get into prayer. So when you're having difficulty in prayer, and sometimes we do, don't we? Have you ever had trouble? Lord, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to say. Ask the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will pray. He will show you how to pray. He will lead you in that prayer. Have you ever been in, in prayer? It, uh, this For me, this is one of those things that happen. You want to pray for somebody and you cannot remember the name. And many times, Lord, please bring that name to my memory. And you know what happens? That name comes to my memory. Ask the Lord to lead you. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. You see, Jesus went up to be alone to pray. We're Christians, the followers of Christ. We need to do the same thing. We need to pray. We need to get alone and pray. We need to be together and pray. Next Sunday, 10 minutes before the service begins, I'm asking you to come. Ladies, men, we'll pray together for 10 minutes. Watch it change your life. Now we're told that when Jesus had finished his prayer, when evening had come, the ship was out in the middle of the sea, it says, and he was alone on land. And he saw them toiling and rowing. Jesus prayed. And eventually he was finished. And you know, it tells us this is the fourth watch. And that's uh, somewhere by Roman time, three to six o'clock in the morning. Jesus prayed a long time. He had many things he wanted to discuss. And now he's on the land. And, and there's the boat with the disciples way out there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And he saw them toiling. They're working hard. The wind is blowing against them. The waves are high and they're working against those waves and they're rowing hard and they're sweating and, and the waves are crashing against their boat. That salt water there, it's just an amazing thing to think about. Their task was difficult and they're straining at the oars. The wind and the waves made rowing so difficult. They thought they were going down. They thought that they were going to sink and they have a fear here of sinking and drowning. But we're told that the Lord saw the disciples toiling in rowing. That's a wonderful and beautiful statement. The Lord saw. 
Jesus saw their difficulty. And more importantly, he understood their problem. You know, we can, you can see sometimes, we see somebody toiling. Do we understand the problem? Maybe we don't. Jesus did. Being totally God, Jesus also knew their thoughts and their fears. And he saw them. I would venture to guess that for most people, the greatest fear in life is death. You think the disciples weren't afraid for their lives that night? They were. Naturally, they didn't want to drown. Their desire was to live, just like most people. We want to live. Death is in us. We don't want to talk. We used to want to talk about that. It's a fear. But you know what? The day is coming when those men, all except one of them, would no longer fear death, but they would stand up strong for Jesus Christ in the face of persecution and not worry. They're going home. But at this point, their faith has not reached that level. They're, they still have a fear. And that was and death was a problem for them. They worried about that. As I said, death for many people, especially the unsaved, is the great unknown. This is when we need to live by faith in God and His Word and His promises. You know, sometimes we'll get together and we'll be talking about it in one of our fellowship meals or something. And we kind of rejoice. If you, you ever listen, we're laughing about death. Why? Because we're just going home. We believe in the promises of God. Without that, I don't know what we would do. We're told to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We know that one day we're going to be with Him. And once you realize that, and once you can accept it by faith, then the fear of death is going to subside. Trust the Lord, believe in His Word, and His promises for you. Do we still think about death? Sure. It's a glass we look through darkly. But we know what's on the other side. So when I look at the struggle of the disciples that night, I'm reminded of the struggles and the cares that we go through in this world. I truly don't know where, where you are today. I don't know your problems. I, mean, I might know a little about this, a little about that, but I don't know all of it. I don't know what position you're in. What I do know is that there are times when all of us struggle, when we toil, when we worry about things. Our struggles in this world and in this life are pretty varied. Different things, different times. And you might be going through an extremely difficult situation at this very moment. There are literally millions of people who right now feel like they're sitting alone in a corner of darkness and there's no help and there's no remedy. They don't know Jesus. Without Jesus, you are in darkness. You know, being only human, you might be facing temptations which are so strong you feel there's no possible way that, that you can get through it. You can't withstand it. Yes, you can. The Lord is never going to tempt you beyond what you're capable of withstanding. And greater is He that is within you than is within the world. The world in which we live is exactly like that stormy sea that night. There's huge waves that are crashing around us. The wind of the world is blowing against us and we feel like at any moment we might sink. I have no doubt whatsoever that you have felt exactly like that and probably many, many times you feel like your little boat of this life is sinking. You're toiling hard against it. You've probably found yourself in that stormy sea, felt yourself going down. You know, we all have a common problem and that problem is that far too often we attempt to comp accomplish things on our own. Well, I can do that. I don't need any help. Famous last words. It's kind of like a, a man taking something home and having the directions. And, well, let me look at the pictures. I don't need any help. And then the chair, when you put it together, it's upside down. That's the way our life is when we try to do it ourselves. There are times, too many times, when we attempt to tackle those problems of the world on our own, and we're defeated. And every time we're defeated, we turn around and say, why didn't you help me, God? Why did you leave me like And we didn't ask him in the first place. But he gets the blame because we try to do it on our own. 
There's something <clears throat> born again believers in Jesus need to learn from this passage. And it's good news. He saw them toiling. He saw them. He knew what they were going through. Jesus sees you when you're rowing against the wind. He sees you when those waves are problems and worries who are coming into your life. Jesus sees you. Not only that, He sees you not only toiling, but He knows all about your problems. You may have not told that problem to anybody in the world. You may not even told the Lord. He knows about it. You may have found yourself in the middle of the ocean, so to speak, in need of help and directions, but you know what? You didn't need to send a flare up to Him to find you. You didn't have to send out an SOS. Jesus knows. Whatever the situation you may find yourself in, Jesus already knows about it. Now, let me say something about sending up a flare or an SOS. That doesn't mean that you're not supposed to pray. He knows where you are. You don't have to send up a signal. Just ask. Why don't you have? You have not. Why? Because you ask not. Hmm. That doesn't mean that you don't have to ask the Lord for help in those situations. I mean only that He already knows about your problem. And He cares about that problem. He does. He cares about every problem in your life. When you find yourself sinking under the weight of this world, and I'm going to tell you right now, when you find yourself sinking, Satan is going to throw as many bags of weight on that boat as he can. You're going to feel like your shoulders are going to bend over and break. And when the waves are overflowing into your little boat while you're toiling against the wind and the waves, turn to the Lord in prayer. Don't give up. Where's your faith centered? In your own personal ability or in the Lord Jesus Christ? If it's in your own ability, you're going to go down like the Titanic. But Jesus saves. If your faith is centered in your own ability, you're going to lose. Jesus saves and He saves in every aspect of your life. Oh, that might, you might commit your way to Him in a very definite manner. It's something that many of us need to do in times of darkness and worry, in times of temptation. Just commit your way unto Him. You know, the reason we're in such a situation, usually anyway, is because we turned away from Him. Now, to really get a complete look at this event, we must look over at Matthew's account. Maybe that's why I had Matthew on my mind this morning. Because Matthew's account tells us something amazing that Peter does not tell Mark. You remember that Mark got his information from Simon Peter. Peter doesn't tell him about walking on water. No record here. Peter tells him the record about Jesus walking on water, but he doesn't mention it himself. Mark got his information on the human plane from Simon Peter, <clears throat> and Peter left out that part of the story. Why would Peter leave out something so important? There are two reasons, I believe, for that. First, humility. By the time Peter relayed this gospel story to Mark, he was a completely changed man. This is not the Peter that we see in the gospel accounts, that proud fellow. The man who would rush into any situation like a bull in a china shop. Who would say things and, well, he's a changed man now. He's not the same man who told Jesus he would never deny him, he would even die for him, and yet denied him three times on the night Jesus was arrested. He's not that same man. He's not the same man who, before he was reinstated when Jesus asked him to feed his sheep. Now he's a changed man. And so when he's telling Mark about Jesus walking on water, Peter did not want anything about anyone except Jesus Christ. At that time in the Apostle Peter's life, the most important person is Jesus Christ. That's it. Mark, don't worry about what I did. I live for the honor and glory of the Lord. Everything I did in my life is because of His power, His glory, and that's what He doesn't say anything about it. 
It's an important lesson for us. We serve the Lord. We serve Him and we don't do it for vain glory. You know, Peter did not want to, anyone to look at him and say, wow, look at Peter walking on the water. In other words, brothers and sisters, you don't need to toot your own horn when you're working for the Lord. You're working for Him. If you're waiting for congratulations of man, you have your reward. And you're not working for the Lord, you're working for that. But you do it for the Lord and your reward is in heaven. And secondly, the Holy Spirit did not inspire Peter's walking on the water to be included in Mark's gospel account. Because the focus is on Jesus Christ. The actions of Christ. Remember I've told you that Mark is a book of action. It's about the actions of Jesus. So it's Matthew that gives us this detail and this account. He says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Well, what a beautiful picture of the Lord and salvation, isn't it? Jesus approaches the boat that night. We're told they were afraid. It's a spirit. You see some of that superstition that's still lingering even with the disciples? This place is a spirit. It's a ghost. The Lord says, it's me. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. But you know, Peter reminds me in this account of like old doubting Thomas. Lord, if it be thou, see the question? He's doubting. If it's really you, then command me to step out there and walk on the water. Well, you know, that's, uh, he's doubting, but I think if he hears the voice, that's what he wants to hear. Remember Thomas, I won't believe until I put my hands in the wounds. He never did. He said that's what he wanted, but he never did that. But there's some doubt in Peter's mind if it's really Jesus or not. But Jesus makes a simple invitation. Come. I wonder if it echoed that night. I've often wondered about that. Come. Or was it just a friendly come? How often does Jesus call out, come? Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Over in Revelation 22, the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So many offers to come. That's love. There was a day when you were sitting maybe in a pew, maybe in a car, maybe at home, I don't know where, and the Lord said, come, and you did. He may have called you a hundred times or a thousand times to come, and you finally heard Him. And you came. It's a wonderful call when Jesus bids you to come. And you came at that invitation. You know, one day He, he called you to salvation. No, He's going to call you again one day. Come. If it's in our lifetime, we're going up. If it's at your death, come home. Come. Be absent the body, present with the Lord. So what did Peter do when the Lord said come? He got out of the boat, began to walk on the water toward Jesus. He took a step of faith from a doubting Thomas to a step of faith. I'm going to tell you what, it takes a lot of faith for me to step out of a boat in the middle of the sea. The waves bouncing around, wind blowing. But he does that. And he's walking on the water because of what he's focusing on Jesus. That's how we get through our life, isn't it? When the waves and the problems, we focus on Jesus, not the world. And that's the way it should be with us. Focus on Jesus and walk in faith. But the times we get in trouble is when we take our eyes off of Jesus and put our focus somewhere else. And that's just what old Peter did that day, wasn't it? He took his eyes off Jesus and he focused on the world and he saw the wind bolsterous and he was afraid and began to sink. 
because he was focusing on the world. Down he went. This world has dragged you down. Who, who's the ruler of this world? The prince of the power of the air. And he wants to drag you down. As long as Peter focused on Jesus, he was able to stand on the water, to walk on the water. And when he began to look at the problems of the winds and the waves, he was struck with fear. He's looking now at everything. He was afraid because he wasn't looking to Jesus, but allowing the things of the world to influence him. Sound familiar? How often did troubles cause us to take our focus off of Jesus and we begin to focus on our worries? And just like Peter, we begin to sink. Today, so many people are not looking to Jesus, but at the problems of this world. Oh boy, we, got, oh, we have so many problems today. Nobody understands the problems. That's not true. They worry about the, the coronavirus, the elections, the economy, and the conspiracy theories, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Anything and everything to take your focus off of the Lord. Well, the elections, it's important. Yes, it's important. What do we do? Focus on the Lord and pray. Well, what about this virus? What are we supposed to do? Focus on the Lord and pray. He will remove it in the perfect time once he's accomplished what he wants to accomplish. But when you trust the Lord, it's one thing. But when you begin to focus on the world, you're going to sink in the world and <clears throat> you begin to sink, fear follows. How many times are believers told in Scripture, fear not? Somebody said it was 365. Might be that many, might be more. But think about that. If it's told that many times, fear not, we're not to fear. Why? Because we're in good hands. And I'm not talking about all state. You see, when the fear of problems of this world begin to overpower you, you begin to sink like Peter. And then, what does he do? He looks, save me. Wonderful words. Save me. You know, there's a world of people out there today who need to say those words and believe it. Save me. They're going to come a day when they wish they would have. I'm going to tell you that right now. They're powerful words when they're spoken by someone who believes, in fact, that Jesus can save them. If you don't believe that, save me doesn't mean a thing. When you begin to sink under the pressure and the fear of this world, call out to Jesus. And something happened. Did you notice that no sooner had Peter cried out to Jesus to save him that Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him? That's how close Jesus is to you every day. He can just reach out and touch you. Reach him. He's there. He's always that close. He sees you. He knows your situation. He cares about you. He loves you. Even when you're involved in sin that you shouldn't be involved in, He loves you. And you know something else? You can't keep Him from loving you. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, He loves you. And when you call out to Jesus to save you, He stretches forth His hand and He places you in His hand. You know, that's the most secure place in all of creation to be is in the hand of the Lord. You know, Jesus talks about that over in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus pulls out his hand. He's going to put you in that hand. That's eternal security. That's eternal security. No better place to be. And then also that verse right there. So many people say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Don't you get tired of hearing that? I and my Father are one. Seven times in John, he says, I am. Don't buy that lie from the pit. What causes people in this world to sink? The problem is one of faith. And that is why Jesus said to Peter, O oh, thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And even believers doubt. We shouldn't, but we do. We don't need to go there. We need to stay in the faith. Peter didn't sink though. 
He called to Jesus to save him, and Jesus saved him. He did. Jesus saved Peter physically that day. And he was also going to save Peter eternally through his precious blood of Calvary. You see, Jesus saw them toiling, just as he sees you toiling. And he entered the boat. What happened when Jesus entered the boat? We're told the wind ceased, the waves were, were sore, they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure. And they wondered. Everything stopped. Jesus stepped in the boat, the waves went down, the, the, the wind quit blowing. They're amazed. What happened when Jesus entered your life? The storms of life ceased. Now I'm not saying that our physical lives are going to be a bed of roses. When you come to Jesus, He never promised you that. He never said you weren't going to have problems. He said you're eternally saved. It means that we are eternally saved and we can look forward to everlasting life with Christ. In this, this world, we're going to have troubles. We're going to have pain. But look beyond that. We're told though that His disciples were amazed in themselves beyond measure. Well, believers, we ought to feel the same way. What? What's he talking about? Why should we be amazed at this miracle? I'm not talking about that. I'm amazed that Jesus would die for me. Are you amazed he would die for you? That's amazing. Jesus loves me enough that he saved me and gave me eternal life. That amazes me. I see people that have come out of really terrible backgrounds, who've done horrible things, who've come to Jesus. It amazes me how Jesus loved that person enough. I'm, a, I'm amazed that Jesus holds my hand through the trials and pains and tribulations in this life. You know, but even though the, the disciples had seen so many great miracles in their life, Jesus continues to amaze them by what he does. You know, it doesn't say, Scripture doesn't tell us that the disciples were amazed that Peter walked on the water. They weren't amazed that Jesus walked on the water. They were amazed that he controlled the, the sun, the, the, the wind and the waves. But every one of Jesus' miracles was designed to bring about a knowledge in them of his true identity. Not only that he was the Messiah, but that he's God. Who controls the weather but God? Who could, excuse me, who could feed the multitude but God? You know, it should not have been a surprise to the disciples or anyone else that the, the long-awaited Messiah was to be God Himself. The Word of God tells us that. It's coming up on Christmas and we'll be reading Isaiah 9-6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That little child who was born in that manger, laid in that manger in Bethlehem, in that stable, was the long-awaited Son, Jesus Christ. Did you hear the titles that were given to the coming Messiah? Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There are important little words here. The mighty God. The means there's only one. The Messiah is going to be God. The everlasting Father. The means there's only one. The Messiah is going to be the everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. There's only one way that you can have peace with God. That's through Jesus Christ. Now let me say right here and now. There's only one that you can call on to save you. And that's Jesus Christ. He asked someone, do you believe? Well, I believe in God. Well, the believe, demons believe and tremble. You need Jesus Christ. Call to Him in faith. Save me. And He will reach out His hand, that nail-scarred hand, and He will lift you out of the waves, and He will save you, and He will hold you in that hand. And He will keep you from hell for all eternity. 
my simple invitation this morning, are you in Jesus' hands? Our Heavenly Father, I pray that everyone here is in Jesus' hands. But if they're not, I pray that they would right now put away that pride, that guilt, that maybe embarrassment that they would feel and come. I can hear you calling right now, come. In every heart, maybe it's for salvation, maybe it's a rededication, maybe it's a service, maybe he's just calling you to pray, but it's come. And Lord, I pray that we would listen and obey. You're so close. Maybe we're sinking, Father, this morning. His hand is right there to pull us out. May we just say, save me and believe it. Father, work in every heart. Give no peace until they make the decision that you want them to make. And I ask this in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.